Good evening. Uh, thank you all for joining the Future Forum tonight for our discussion on women in leadership. The Future Forum is an organization that brings together individuals with different backgrounds, experiences, and points of view to discuss the pressing issues that affect us today. Our goal is to create civil, informed, and bipartisan discussions, which is needed now more than ever. The Future Forum's events are made possible by our incredible members and our sponsors. And if you are not a member, I strongly encourage you to sign up before you leave tonight, or at the very least, visit lbjfutureforum.org to learn more. I'd also like to recognize Rosemary's Catering for donating all of the delicious food that you'll have tonight, and to our beverage sponsors, Carbock Brewery and Austin Wine Merchant. <laughs> The forum is hosting its last event of the season in two weeks on May 31st on the Mayor's Task Force Report on Racism and Inequity in the City. Mayor Adler will be joined by several other speakers to discuss that report and our recommendations for moving forward and how we can overcome. Full details for that event and registration to sign up are available on the website. I'm incredibly excited to begin tonight's conversation and please keep in mind there will be time for questions at the end of the discussion. And we encourage you all to stay with us afterwards to continue the conversations and try some of that delicious food from Rosemary's Catering. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Emily Ramshaw, Editor-in-Chief of the Texas Tribune and our moderator to introduce our guests. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. It's so great to see such an awesome crowd. Um, obviously amazing women, but there are also a lot of gentlemen here, which I'm thrilled about. And um, this is the first one of these that I've moderated where there is actually booze ahead of time, <laughs> which means this will be a livelier than average discussion. We are thrilled to have you here. Um, this event is called Women in Leadership, Leading Ladies, and I am so lucky to be joined on stage by three women who are not just leaders in their own right, um, but are helping to build the next generation of strong female leaders in Austin and in Texas more broadly. Uh, they are Toya Bell, the Deputy Chief Ethics Officer for the Texas Health and Human Services Commission. Toya is an attorney with more than 25 years of experience. She's also the chair-elect of Leadership Austin, vice chair of the Austin Bar Foundation, and founding chair of the Long Center for the Performing Arts Advisory Council. Melly Price is the executive director of commercialization at UT Austin's Dell Medical School, meaning basically she's the badass boss of all new technology. <laughs> She is the co-founder of the startup accelerator Capital Factory, and she founded Frontgate Tickets, which was later sold to Live Nation. She won the Austin Business Journal's 2015 Profiles and Power Award. And Erica Sines is UT Austin's Associate Vice President for Community and External Relations. Uh, previously, she served in the Chancellor's Office at UCLA. She also serves on the board of Goodwill Industries, I Live Here, I Give Here, and the Hispanic Alliance, among other organizations. Uh, please help me welcome this incredible group of panelists. <laughs> All right, so we'll have about 40 minutes of moderated conversation followed by 15 to 20 minutes of audience Q&A, so keep drinking and come up with some good ones. <laughs> Um, the three of you are brilliant, strong, empowered women in really incredible jobs. I mean, at the pinnacles of, of your careers in government, technology, the highest echelons of university administration. Um, what did you have to overcome to get in the positions you're in today? Because it wasn't all just an easy rise to the top. Toya, why don't you start? Thanks. Um, I think, you know, being aware of what your skill set is and, and constantly working to grow that skill set. So that was something that I consciously did. Um, I also thought about what are all the different things that you can do as an attorney? I love being a lawyer, and so I wanted to continue practicing law, but I also wanted to do something different that was part of executive leadership and part of management. So I think one of the key things that I, I pass along to each of you is to think about your options throughout your career and to have multiple plans and multiple traje trajectories so that when those doors of opportunity open, you're ready to step through them. And don't be afraid to promote yourself and make sure that people know what your skill set is, or skill set is and all the different talents that you have because that's something that I've had to work at making sure that people know about all the things that I can do and all the broad experience that I have. Um, and that's really helped me to have the current position that I have, but it's also helped me in inspiring other people because I mentor a lot of people, and so I'm always telling them, think about where you want to be a few years from now. What skill sets do you have? What skill sets do you need to cultivate? 
and who do you need to inform about your talents and your skills? So because who if you keep it you, to yourself, yeah. it doesn't help. You have to share that information. Who did you have to inform about your talents? Was there a time when you had to say to someone, hey, look, I deserve this seat at the table? I came forward and said, this is what I do. I'm an ethic, I'm an, a, my background is labor and employment law. I've also practiced as an ethics attorney. I'm trained as a mediator. So making sure that people knew that these are my skill sets, this is what I do, and I'm an expert in this area. Hmm. Melly, what about you? Thanks for starting with one of the hardest questions first. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, they'll get harder. <laughs> and can I just say, this is the coolest forum. Uh, I'm looking out, it's like, little blocks of wood with wine and good people. Yes. Um, so thank you for, for having me. Um, I, I'm actually a little embarrassed to answer the question. And the reason is that, um, you know, I was, I was born into privilege. And I, uh, the biggest thing I had to overcome to tap into more of my potential was myself. I didn't have a lot of third party um, obstacles. I, you know, I, I was given an education. Um, and, and really the, the journey for me about leadership, and quite frankly, I think it's a lifelong journey and it's one I'm still in, is, is figuring out how to get out of my own way. There's amazing people who cre create opportunity around us all the time and our own insecurities and our own fear of failure and you know, just the programming that we come up with through whatever circumstances we come up with. And so the, the journey of self-awareness has been key for me, and quite frankly, I was a late bloomer <laughs> in, in, that, in that department. So um, early on, it was about just the hustle, just hard work, and, uh, and, and I think every young person that's successful starts there. But then it becomes, I think, a more complex set of things. It's skill development, it's timing, it's self-awareness. Um, but I think that for our young people are really, um, that's one of the things I actually love about the millennial generation is they do have a, uh, a propensity for um, looking inward, maybe sometimes too much, but uh, you know, that, how can we harness that and turn that in, you know, to a really great asset for the next generational leaders? And so what uh, is the specific example of a time where you had to get out of your own way? Oh gosh, every day. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are so many times when my need to be right, my need to feel smart, my need to feel validated, my need to feel liked got in my way of perfectly lovely opportunities that I could have just rocked from the beginning. And you know, you're just laying there, you know, type, typical type A personality that, that gets women all the labels, um, you know, the, the stereotypes that we come with. And, and just not having to do that has has created so much more freedom and quite frankly joy in, in the task of doing things. You know, I carried responsibility so heavy when I was young. Oh, I'm responsible, I am a CEO, I'm a young CEO woman. And you know, it, there's, there's no fun in that. That doesn't inspire people to wanna work with you and travel the journey with you. So um, literally every day uh, and just trying to get out of my way is probably the biggest uh, gift, and it's brought me the most pleasure um, as I've gotten older. So now I'm in this amazing situation where um, I get to leverage that and invite other people on the journey, and and that's you know that to me is probably the the biggest blessing of getting older and and growing in my career. Erica, what about you? What stumbling blocks were there that you had to uh, surpass to get into your current position? You know, I had a, another answer, but I, I want to play off of yours because I had the I think exact opposite. Yeah. existence, at least beginning-wise. Um, low income, first generation, English was my second language, but I didn't know how underprivileged I was. Um, and I didn't know the lack of opportunities that were not falling before me. Um, so in a way, that was sort of a positive thing. Uh, but then once I came to the University of Texas and I moved to Austin in 1993, I was like, completely blown away by how much catching up I had to do. Um, quickly, my school was not as competitive as other peer schools of my UT valedictorian colleagues, which was not. Um, and, and the hustle too, in that way we're similar. I just thought, okay, I see what privilege is now. I see I didn't have it. I'm glad I 
I was embarrassed by some of those things growing up, but I didn't know it was have, have not, you know? Um, but here, and, and being exposed to information and education and opportunities that I knew I did not have um, really lit a fire for, for the hustle and the knowledge and the learning and coming at it from the most positive way possible too because no one likes an angry person. Um, <laughs> the bitter, you know, person. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it, it was a, it's been a, a very interesting late bloomer type um, atmosphere for me as well. Yeah. Well, I think actually you just touched on something fascinating, which is, you know, nobody likes this, but the bitter, angry woman, right? And, you know, we're all sort <laughs> of... people, not just Right, people, people in general, but, but women in particular. You know, yeah. we're sort of hardwired to think about our behavior in certain settings. Yeah. And, you know, I, I want to talk about, about moments where you felt like um, you were up against a, a stigma or a stereotype. I mean, you know, I was a, a young woman covering a Texas legislature that was filled with older white men, and there were absolutely times where I felt self-conscious or talked down to. And, and, you know, we're not really rewarded for speaking out about those kinds of experiences. What are times in your careers where you all felt, have felt like you've been up against that? And, and be specific. I'm um, going to let whichever one of you wants to jump in. I'm sure you all basically have Basically, <laughs> every, every executive or senior level meeting I've ever been in at UT or anywhere really in the community. Wow. Even at nonprofit boards who claim to embrace diversity and care about those sorts of things. Um, in what ways know, does it matter? Primary manifest? education right. has been, was so do feminine dominant and higher ed is so male dominant. It's such a reverse culture. Um, I think behavior, you're right, you know, that um, especially in a non-diverse environment of literally just a meeting, um, I was, I'm very fortunate to work for a vice president who puts me in those situations that I ordinarily would not have the opportunity of being in and says, you're going to be my proxy, go, and go sit in that meeting and be brilliant. Yep. And so, I <laughs> and say, so you do. Yes. <laughs> um, but I mean, those specific instances of the, they, they underestimate what you're able to contribute at the table, I feel like pretty consistently. Um, and then you open your mouth and you're overprepared and you're thinking about your behavior and your ladylike, la, 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 whatevers, um, and <laughs> all those things. And then you have to also perform. Like you also have to meet those expectations and probably exceed them if you're, you know, if you're really prepared correctly. So um, the layers that we have to we have to engage in with all of those background things, noise, um, I feel like Maybe some men deal in those multiple layers, but certainly women um, have to navigate those. I think mm -hmm. there are not as many men who are thinking in the back of their head, don't be shrill, don't be shrill. Mm -hmm. Right, right. <laughs> oh, that was my bitch face. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you can use those words here Sorry. among friends. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, my, my uh, adversity, I think, has been much more subtle. Quite frankly, I think I was not attuned to it in my younger life. Um, I, my experience of it was more around my sexuality because I've been out um, since I was 15. And so, you know, in the early days, particularly with any venture capital related things, mm -hmm. there was, um, I think my adversity has come in the form of being invited into the room, but then not actually heard. And so that experience of being a young tech woman who, you know, they, they would say they wanted the voice, but then it wouldn't actually show up in the decision-making process. And then, quite frankly, I'm actually experiencing the most of it that I've experienced in my life in my current chapter, and that's in the healthcare ecosystem. Wow. The healthcare ecosystem at the executive levels is dominated by men and, and generally uh, white men and generally older men. Mm -hmm. And not that there's, you know, anything um, wrong with their life or their experience, but that for some reason that's been the development of that ecosystem. And it's, I think it's something that we have to overcome to accomplish our sort of national mission of you know, improving health outcomes and lowering costs and fixing mm -hmm. this broken system. We need more voices in there. Um, and yet I'm, it's profound to me that you know, here I am in my 40s at the you know, top of my career and I went to a meeting last week and I was one woman out of 16 men, and I was the only person under 50. Oh. And I, I was just like, oh. <laughs> where are they? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, so it was, it was very interesting. Yeah. And it's a heavier weight, right, for you? Do you feel, I feel like a heavier sense of responsibility to then represent all womankind and certainly Latinos. <laughs> because they will all be judged by my quality of knowledge. Um, and it, it's just a, it, that's not a burden that, that everyone shares. I think part of it is also uh, being aware of implicit biases that are out there. Um, in, in my case, you know, many times I've been the only African American, mm -hmm. or the only African American woman, or the only woman. And so being in those settings, that's not really, I guess, the, where I'm uncomfortable. I went to a very small school in San Antonio, it was called Keystone School, and I went there K through 12, and there were only 20 students allowed per grade level. So many of the classes were even smaller. I think the, the graduating class ahead of me only had 15 students in it. Hmm. And in my graduating class, there were just two African Americans. At the most, there were four during the whole time from kindergarten through 12th grade. So even though I grew up and had you know, a, a community, a church home, and other organizations that I was in, but in my day-to-day, -day, every day at school, I was just one of few. And then that kind of proceeded in college and then graduate school and then all the different things that I've been involved in. So I, th I think that being aware of implicit bias that's out there, because I haven't really expressed, experienced that really direct, overt mm -hmm. activity, but keeping your eyes and ears open to implicit bias, I think is really important for, for all of us because there can be implicit bias even in systems. You know, now people are sort of talking about systems thinking, systems mm -hmm. design there are implicit biases that are built into systems that people don't even know. And so that's why you have healthcare disparities. That's why you have educational disparities. It's because of the implicit bias in the system, not always the overt racism or sexism or, or bias that might be expressed. So, I mean, explain, explain that concept of implicit biases and how it has related to you. Like, give, give us an example of a time where you've experienced implicit bias. Um, I would say in instances, and this is, this is one that I think many of the African Americans, maybe others in the room might identify with. Um, you know, we're all educated, we're all professional, we're engaged in our communities and our, in our places of work and we're excelling. And then someone says, oh, you're so articulate. <laughs> they don't say that to me. No. <laughs> Thank you. You know, and I want to say, are you surprised I speak the king's English? You know, I, right. I was an English major. I graduated from Rice. I'm an attorney. But so, you know, things like, or you, you carry yourself so well. The, you know, and it's, and it's said with a smile, and it may not be meant in a malicious way, but when you hear that over and over again, you're thinking, why? Is that what you're noticing? Is that, is that what you notice? Maybe not that. I was correct, or that I solved this situation, or this problem, or I executed on the assignment. But the comment is, oh, you're really articulate. You know, I actually have a yeah. question about implicit bias. Um, because as you were talking, one of the things that I was thinking is that for those of us that have been in a unique uh, situation where we're the one in many, mm -hmm. that often becomes a competitive advantage. And I was not real active in supporting um, other women in, earlier in my career, it's really been something that I've come to understand, you know, that, that I need to be proactive. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't, it was not in any malicious way, it was just in a, it was an advantage, right? And I, I was in the room and uh, my focus wasn't on bringing other women into the room or other LGBT people into the room. Mm -hmm. It was, I was comfortable being the person in that role. So is that an implicit bias within me to, um, to not see the value of bringing others into the fold? Is that, is, does that fall in that? You know, I don't, I don't know. I would, I brought this book because <laughs> mm -hmm. there's a book called Blind Spot that I recommend to everyone about implicit bias. Yeah. And um, the, it's Blind Spot, Hidden Biases of Good People. And the professor, uh, Mazarin uh, Banaji, she spoke here at UT. They have a Women in the Law um, Summit, a conference that happens every other year. And it's a fantastic conference. And women who are attorneys from all over the country, it's by invitation only. And they have these great speakers. And so one year, I was leading a work group of young attorneys at my agency who were interested in becoming ethics advisors. 
And one of the things that I put on our calendar for us to do was to attend the lecture that she provided on implicit bias. Because when you're interviewing people and you're hearing their concerns, whether it's, you know, in my case, employment law or an ethics complaint or inquiry, you want to make sure that you're thinking clearly and that you're not, there's no implicit bias in the way that you receive the information right. that someone's sharing with yeah. you, in the way you conduct your investigation, whether you take that, this complaint seriously, more seriously than others because of who brought it. Right. How do you deliver the result? Yeah. Um, those are all things that you have to think about when you're going through any exercise in your day-to-day -day life. Is, is there something that causes me to favor one person over the other? And well, I may not yeah. even know it. And yeah, so I wanted right. them to be exposed yeah. to that. And, um, and that's how I ended up yeah. learning a little bit more about implicit bias yeah. and yeah. studying good, it more and more. That is a really good book. And uh, I think generally you were not. But if it was ever geared at a person based on some characteristic, whether it's visible or invisible, mm -hmm. um, then perhaps yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm curious how you all go about then, um, then you know, building te diverse and inclusive teams. I mean, I had a huge blind spot. You know, we've been working really hard at the Tribune to further diversify our ranks to make our newsroom look more emblematic of Texas. And I hired a, a, a few young African-American reporters, and I was asking them for a great speaker for a, a Tribune Festival panel. And I, I wrote an email that said, I'm looking for someone like really vibrant and well-spoken. And a young black male reporter, thank God, he came up to me afterward, and he said, look, I don't want to make you uncomfortable, but I just want to tell you, that's like a dog whistle term. You know, you shouldn't write that in an email to, you know, young reporters of color. And I was obviously mortified, but, you know, it's, I was grateful that he was comfortable to come talk to me about it. So, so how do you all take these kinds of factors into consideration and, and try to build teams that are more inclusive than the ones that, that you've gotten a chance to be a part of? Mm -hmm. I mean, for, for me, it's, it's the work that we do in the division, so I have a super easy practical answers. Um, like you really have to think about um, those visible and invisible diverse qualities that someone may hold. So the vertical diversity qualities, things that are visible, gender, um, ethnicity, um, those sorts of things, and then the horizontal diversity um, factors which are more invisible, someone's religion or someone's um, sexual orientation, someone's um, ability or disability, and sometimes ability and disability is both depending on if it's a physical disability. Um, so thinking about all of those ways in which people identify is something we do all day, every day. And then, in addition to that, just to add another interesting layer, is thinking about um, interdiversity and intra. So just because you hire one African American, you can check that box. Um, that human being does not represent that entire community. The same thing for other Asian communities, a perfect example of this too, because there's so much diversity within that, uh, within that population. And so figuring out how to then get some intra diversity too, where it's not just about those specific things, but diversity within those categories. And you know, we're, you're saying it's not about checking a box. But yep. Melly, we were just talking about, about women in particular a moment ago. I mean, on the 2016 campaign trail, and I promise we're not talking about politics here. Oh, please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Madeleine Albright got a lot of flack for basically saying, I think the quote, the quote was, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. Mm -hmm. Is true, mm -hmm. false, complicated? I think that's complicated. You know, sort of drawing on that, the last question, which is how do you build diverse teams? Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm embarrassed, again, I'm, embar I'm embarrassed at who I've been in the course of my life, apparently. <laughs> this is gonna be like a big therapy session, just write right. it all out. Yeah. And, uh, and, and of course, it's recorded, which makes it even <laughs> more terrifying. That's right. But the, uh, the truth for me, like it's a big trigger for me. I've, I've always really resented being given an opportunity because I was a woman or because somebody was checking the LGBT box mm -hmm. on their mm -hmm. board of directors, you know, diversity and inclusion thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's complex. I, it's something, quite frankly, I struggle with personally on like what's my position on this? And then the, in my role as the director of diversity at Capital Factory, I struggle with what's our position as a tech, tech hub. And what, what it took for me to sort of just have a, a personal policy around building teams is I had to authentically find a place within myself where I saw the value of diversity. Not, and I don't really mean the visible diversity, yeah. like the power of a team 
that has multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. And until I got to that place, I was hiring very homogenous people that reflected the things that I valued. And mm -hmm. it wasn't until my early 30s when I saw the shift of like, it is really, like I'm a business person. It's valuable to my business to be able to talk to different markets and be able to look at different perspectives. And then at that point, it didn't change my hiring practices. It changed what I saw. And so I just finally was able to create more diversity in my teams, um, particularly like in the front gate call center and things like that, that, um, that I don't know that I would have, uh, you know, you hire, especially when you're in a small business and you know, you're only hiring 20 or 30 people, it's really easy to end up with people that reflect the things that you like, right? And you're the boss and they wanna please you. And, um, and so I really think it's important that we do more work with people on helping them understand explicitly what, where their businesses will benefit from bringing different voices, different mm -hmm. ages, different political perspectives, you know, diversity across the board. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be so hard on yourself though because the, well, one, there's a lot of research that supports all that, so that's good. You know, yes. always just look it up. But, um, <laughs> but also, I don't, I don't think you were um, having, like, non divert you were not supporting diversity. It's, it's a matter of inclusion and exclusion. I'm, uh, I actually, I think check the boxes is, like, bare minimum. You need to do that. Like, diversity should be the easiest thing you work on because it's kind of numbers. Um, inclusion? Much more difficult, mm -hmm. much more difficult Complex. to do. Well, now how do you incorporate those perspectives and those experiences into your business or into your environment um, and have them be valued and then be beneficial, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and those things are also, there's just work and cyclical and, and it's, you know, it's, it's an important part of, of that mm -hmm. formula, but one cannot be without the other. That's yeah. right, and there's, there's a, a famous quote, I can't remember who said it, but it's, it's great to be invited to the party, but it's even better to be invited to dance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as you're thinking about building your teams, mm -hmm. you know, think about maybe first start with your personal circle. I mean, I, I've always had a very diverse group of friends. Mm -hmm. So again, it's not uncommon for me to be around lots of different people with different viewpoints, different ages, religions, backgrounds. Um, and then being in the area of labor and employment law, again, with, along with what Erica was saying, well, you know, diversity is part of that, thinking mm -hmm. in that way and realizing how important it is to have diversity. Um, I was gonna mention that, you know, um, uh, Melly and I are both on the Leadership Austin board. And this year, our board may have been one of the most diverse nonprofit boards mm -hmm. in Austin. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it's really brought so much value to us because our board meetings, we, really, we don't go over committee reports. We have strategic planning discussions and the voices of so many different people different ages, different professions, different income levels, different religions. I mean, all of that comes into the fabric of what we're talking about and what we're planning to do uh, to help continue to take Austin to even higher levels. But I know we couldn't do that without the diversity of the group that we have at yeah, the table. Yeah, totally true. I, wanna, I want to hear from all three of you on advocating for yourself as a woman. I mean, you know, my mom always said to me, the worst thing anybody can ever say is no. So I took that advice and asked for things. You know, I asked for a raise when I was on maternity leave. I asked for, you know, <laughs> whatever. I will ask for anything. Maybe I'll get it, maybe I won't. But, but I see with a lot of even the young women who work for me that, that men tend to be much, on average, much better advocates for themselves. They'll ask for jobs they're not qualified for. They'll ask for money even if they already just asked for a raise, you know, six months yeah. ago. Why don't women do that the same way men do? And, and how do you all guide the women who work for you uh, to be better advocates for themselves? You know, I'd say avoid self-sabotaging behavior. Um, and and a, specific, a specific example that I hear repeatedly, it is, yeah, <laughs> is a, that I hear repeatedly is a lot of times an opportunity will come up and if the women in the room will say, oh, you know, I haven't taken a course in that or I don't have any experience doing that or maybe after I get my certification that I could do that, the men in the room will say, oh, I can do it. <laughs> and they'll phone a friend who knows how to do it they'll find out how to or do it. Or they'll come ask you. Or they'll come ask us how to do it. You're like, so, I'm working on that exactly. anyway. Exactly. That is the story of my life. You're so, speaking to you know, don't, don't be afraid to take <laughs> risks. Because it's about taking those risks. And of course, you don't want to get way out there in an area that yeah. you don't know right. anything about. Right. But don't be afraid to take risks because most things are doable. And most things can be learned. Um, but I think as a gender, we hear examples all, all the time, and probably many of us have done this as well. 
is step back from something because we feel like we're not qualified, not because someone told us we weren't. All right. Yeah, I, I, kind of along those lines, I think um, any, any young, younger folks or anyone that I mentor, period, um, I, it's kind of back to the value thing. Like, and, until you really value yourself and your contribution and, and have that confidence, I think it, it is hard. Advocacy, just for advocacy's sake, generally isn't successful because I think, you know, the people that you're, you're asking sniff that out. And so, um, you know, my advice is really to go to the core of figure out what it's going to take for you to believe what you're asking for and then, and then, you know, you can sell ice to Eskimos. <laughs> yeah. And I think you really have to stand behind whatever you're advocating yourself to be or do. Mm -hmm. So if you're constantly talking about how collaborative you are and what a wonderful team player you are and how amazing, you know, coworker you are, and then, and then on the other yeah. hand, you do not behave in the manner that those qualities right. would require, um, it's very off-putting, and it's um, it's just it, it makes it so clear that you're you're unaware even um, of what you're advocating for because you 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 aren't executing those actions through your day-to-day -day work. Yeah, you know, women have to have like a a two x say to do ratio as men. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like if you say you're going to do it, you better do it. Uh, uh, you know and. Right. And knowing what the core competencies are for the mm -hmm. things that you want to do. So once you know what those core competencies are, whether you find them on, on an evaluation form or one of those 360 forms, you know, 360 reviews, it has, what are the core competencies behind people who really are collaborative? What are the core competencies around people who really are visionary leaders? Mm -hmm. right. And those are the things you should be working toward. Right. But at the same time that you are pursuing this really aggressive course, or women in general are pursuing this aggressive course, you know, statistics show that there are huge wage disparities the moment that women have kids. I mean, there was a great New York Times story about it three days ago that motherhood was the single best indicator of a pay gap behind men. Or there was a great Wall Street Journal story about a week ago about women still predominantly being the primary caregivers for elderly parents, and that the biggest indicator of your safety and security as an elderly American is having a daughter. Yes. I mean, yeah, right, exactly, I know. I can, I can quit now. Yeah, sorry, you're in Sophie, trouble. you're yeah. only six today. I have a cat. But they yeah, right. You're really in trouble, yeah. So, you're worst off of everybody. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so this is, this is not to say, obviously, that, that men don't play key and crucial roles, right. but, but overwhelmingly, women are still shouldering. So, so how do we pursue mm -hmm. these high-powered, you know, the, up, the highest echelons of, of our careers and still face these you know, serious obligations. How do we balance it? It's like working twice as hard. Well, and the, the crazy thing is, for me is that, again, one of the things I'm like not super proud of is when I was in my 20s hiring women, um, you know, I had account managers that were in their 30s starting to have families. And, and I unfortunately would be like, seriously, your kid's sick again? <laughs> you know, like I couldn't comprehend because yeah. I did not have kids that, um, you know, they could have strep throat one week and, I don't know, lice the next week or what, <laughs> whatever it is that they do or that your whole family could be taken down for, you know, just three simultaneous weeks over okay. some bug. And so I was, I was quite frankly fairly intolerant of that. And after employing, you know, again at a small business level, literally hundreds and hundreds if not a few thousand people, um, women who have families, are so much more effective. Like I, as I, a gross totally generalization, yep. I'm probably not supposed to grossly generalize and like That's an equality right. related thing. <laughs> but you know, like the, uh, they're miracle workers. They get more done and have more focus and more precision and more okay. dedication and are so effective with time management. And yet here they are at the bottom of the pay scale. It's it's mind blowing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's got to be research science around this that. Like media organizations can publish things <laughs> about this gro this unfortunate disparity. Right. Exactly. exactly. Either of you want to weigh in on that? Gosh, you know, I. I mean, we, I see it even now. I think it's very different, um, private sector and the public sector. I think, fortunately, um, for us at a university, I I find that we're much more. 
um, nurturing and accepting of those kinds of priorities in people's, in people's lives. Certainly that's been my experience um, at the university where um, those things seem to be the norm and you're given that kind, yeah, of, there's a lot more that kind of flexibility. Uh, in, in, a, in a much different way than I have heard the private sector has perhaps historically been. So um, those A lot of it has to do that. with the structures to manage it, though. Yeah. You know, in a small business, you're not generally, you know, the tracking and the, the policies and stuff are, they're there technically, but the enforcement of them is very different than, in a, than the experience I've had in a, you know, a large state organization where it's pretty easy to say, okay, well, we quit paying you here. <laughs> because, you know, everything, whereas when you, you've got somebody that you've been kind of flexible with, they just had a kid, maybe they need it longer, you know, it gets messy in small business. Well, or I some, yeah. well, I was gonna say something I've also seen is in an evolution is, you know, I remember uh, practicing law earlier in my career in a workplace where they'd never had a woman who had a baby, right? Mm -hmm. And so when one of my colleagues had a baby, Leading up to her going on maternity leave, there was a lot of confusion and just questioned to ask, like, what's going to happen? Yeah. What are we going to do? What are we yeah. going to do? And she was, and she was nervous too because there wasn't a plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and then moving from that phase to okay, most places have maternity leave and there's a policy, but you can only be gone so long. And if you're gone longer than that, if you don't have any vacation time, you may not have a job to come back to. Yeah. To now seeing maternity and and, and paternity leave, so. Now couples, both the mother and the father, are either taking time off together or they're staggering it so they can both be with their baby when the baby's little, mm -hmm. but neither one has to worry about jeopardizing their career or their livelihood. And so it's been nice just to yeah. see that progression. And you see how quickly things are changing because we're both, we're all three of us, all four of us are very young, but over this period of time, <laughs> yeah. we've seen some really great strides in that area. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, companies that don't offer the same paternity benefits as maternity benefits, maybe it's implicit, maybe it's explicit bias. You know, we are sort of reinforcing these same challenges. I mean, we've started really encouraging men at our organization to take the full three months of paternity leave because it sets that expectation and hopefully is improving lives for their, their wives. So mm -hmm. I do think it's, it's something we need to keep working on. Well, I mean, the three of you are, are leaders in your own right, but we never stop learning. I mean, how, how do you keep um, progressing and developing as leaders? As you mentioned, we're also very young. <laughs> how do you make sure you're still a phenomenal, even better leader, you know, five years from now than you are today? I, I love to learn. You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm curious about so many different things. And so there are things that I do on my own, but I also, you know, take an opportunity to learn from, you know, this Women in the Law Power Summit that I just mentioned. We just had another one this year, and it's great to be around, you know, peers and other women who have excelled to even higher levels in the legal profession and, you know, have speakers like, you know, Valerie Jarrett and um, lots of other nationally known people are coming to talk about the law, their career, for her, you know, she had a great presentation on life in, the, in your responsibility as a government employee. And when you work for the government, what's the burden that you carry? And, and that it's not about power, it's about responsibility. That your, your burden every night is responsibility to the taxpayers and the people that you serve and take care of. Um, so going to things like that has really been inspiring to me. Um, of course, you know, these leadership programs, Leadership Texas, Leadership Boston, um, uh, we're both alumni of the Texas Lyceum, Emily and I are. We're gonna have a program in Washington that's coming up where we'll be having fireside chats with you know, people who are ambassadors and very high-ranking government officials. And so we'll learn about their careers and their tra trajectories and their challenges. And we learn from each one of those experiences. So I would encourage you all to, to do those things. Oh, and one other thing I was gonna mention when you were talking about Madeleine Albright. So Madeleine Albright came to Austin, it's been several years ago, and she had a book signing. How many of you have seen that book? It's, it's about her pin collection, the lapel pins that she wears. Mm -hmm. Well, most of those pins have a story behind them that's related to her life as the secretary, you know, her career as secretary of state. And she had some phenomenal stories mm -hmm. even about world leaders, many of whom were men, and why she chose to wear a particular pin and what it meant and her own defiance that she showed by wearing some of these pins. So that, you know, that was a fun thing that I did with another girlfriend. I look for interesting things like that to do with, with my other girlfriends and with my husband, Stephen, who's here, who, who um, I love hanging out with. But those are all ways that you can learn formally and informally. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I, 
I think you've probably figured out by now. I, I don't know who said it, maybe it was just my grandma, that the older you get, the less you know. <laughs> and I am totally guilty of that. Um, as I get older, I'm like, oh my God, I totally thought I knew that, and I so didn't have a clue. And so the the journey for me on leadership, I'm, I'm kind of a simpleton at the end of the day. I try to find people that embody the person that I would like to be, and I, and I try to hang out with them and learn from them, and um, that's way more effective for me than I, I'm really grateful for the like professional leadership development opportunities I've had along the way. But the the most life changing, I think, you know, helping me become a a better human being, a better friend, a better mom, a better partner, you know, those those things have come from uh, just being around amazing people. And, you know, growing up, I didn't, I didn't really have figureheads. You know, I, I don't know if, if you all had that experience, but I didn't really sort of get that you could model your behavior uh, after somebody else. And so mm -hmm. I am constantly looking for amazing people and, and constantly trying to figure out <laughs> how to not be a total dolt. Um, <laughs> In life, and, but but then for me, as I moved, I've moved away from being just a, a software as a service entrepreneur into this, um, you know, relationship where I am serving the taxpayers, mm -hmm. uh, in my role at the University of Texas, and I've really been enjoying, quite frankly, learning from my colleagues like Toya, who have been in that kind of role for a long time and understanding more about the responsibilities and uh, the thought processes. And so there is a professional development for me, but it's always sort of related to the job I have at that time. The leadership development has really been a function of, you know, spiritual leaders, friends, family, also learning from people that, you know, you don't want to be mm -hmm. like um, <laughs> is equally as effective. Very, very That's important good. and critical. I'm especially in professional settings when someone is behaving in a way that is negative in your perspective or your or someone's reacting negatively to to that you um, you have to be able to think to yourself do not act like that man is acting um, <laughs> ever do never speak to people that way um, it, yeah. it's such important lessons I mean I feel like this is just as critical as it is by good good model examples um, certainly bad negative examples are essential to to, to how not to be um, and I think as we um, grow and develop to and, and learn from those models and those figures. Um, one of my awareness things is that then you start kind of becoming that person that then younger people look to, and then you have to sit up straight and remember <laughs> that you know um, students are listening to you and, and looking to you um, to be uh, you know brilliant and insightful as well, and to and to model the behaviors that they then will see um, and replicate in their own style, um, I think is, is also really essential and important. Great. I also think, you know, being quiet enough to listen. You know, when you're in a meeting, many times when I'm yes. in a meeting, I could be in a board meeting, I could be in a meeting at work, but I'll just listen. Observe how individuals interact with each other. Mm -hmm. Observe how their interactions are received. Yep. And then you learn a lot about how to communicate with other people. And then you start, the, and then start reflecting on yourself. Mm -hmm. How are you communicating with other people? How are you being received? How do people respond when you ask them to do something? And that'll tell you a lot about your leadership style and things mm -hmm. that you can tweak and start working on, but you have to spend the time to listen and be reflective and be self-aware and sometimes be self-critical because for all of us, sometimes there are things that need to be changed or they need to be tweaked, but you're not gonna be aware of that. And you, it's better to be self-aware and start learning on your own than to have something, something harsh happen Mm -hmm. And it's because of something that you could have fixed, but you just were too blind to see it. Then there's just the, like, fail, fail fast model. Yeah. It's just like, every day I step in a pile, and then I, <laughs> I learn from it. Oh, right. yeah. And I try not to do that same thing again. Okay. All right, well, we would like to learn from you all now. Uh, I'm sure you all have better questions than I had, so please um, raise your hands, and we would love to hear from you. Yeah. Um, one thing that you all just Like kind of what do you do with those negative opinions that infiltrate the group? 
I usually, and this is something I learned from my vice president, positive modeling, never come from it from a deficiency direction. Um, if someone has come, even if they're not seemingly being exclusive or, or showing some sort of bias, always come from some positive perspective about how they perhaps should have seen that or how they could reflect on that um, or how you perceive something to be. Um, instead of coming at it as, you know, no, you're wrong because you're actually saying this person and you're discriminating and it's actually illegal and we're going to sue you. Um, <laughs> say the positive aspects of of that perspective, whatever that opposite of that is, come to it with that opposite perspective. Um, and bring it as genuine as you can without being catty and without being, mm -hmm, I told you, or whatever. Just really expressing, coming from, from, coming from it to it from a positive place and not from deficiency has worked such miracles for me. I mean, miracles in a meeting where you are going towards a no and you just, change your perspective and you change your tactic in that way. Um, and, and I've seen that turn into a yes or into a, <laughs> let's think about it some more and we might, we might be able to do that. Or we might be able to do something. It's um, a great so opportunity important. to hone your perspective to the, the, that, that which we resist persists is, a, is like a really great mantra for me. Typically when I'm in strong resistance to somebody, it's a reflection of of my own position, and it, yeah. it's an opportunity to clarify that and fortify it, and you know, reflect. And so, a lot of times, I um, I face controversy with more like a Socratic message mm -hmm. method of of asking questions and and trying to truly understand the perspective. I I know I can always say uh, I'm I'm done. Um, so usually, usually I try to embrace it. It's getting more difficult these days. The woman in the black and then the woman in the white and black right there. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to collaboration impact versus um, competition because that's such a difficult thing for women in particular. I don't know if that's generational or not, if you see anything different in younger women, but we have to be effective at work. And so you want to mentor and collaborate, but how do you compete? Hmm. I'm going to say something flippant like, are they different? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I, I actually think competition's gotten a bad name. Uh, I think competition can be really effective in the workplace if it's done respectfully and, and it's, you know, so collaboration um, between people, in my experience, between people that respect each other and are working towards a common goal with common purpose, um, you know, that that sparring, that, you know, trying on different and opposing views, I, I think can be really powerful. I would say not to personalize it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about you and your success. And it's easy to get derailed if you're thinking about what's the other person doing and what are they doing and how do they do that and how do they get that and I'm going to do what they do. Think about what you want to do and how are you going to get there. And what are, the, what are the competencies that you need? What are the skills you need? What are the relationships that you need. We've been talking about skills and competencies, but relationships are just as important, maybe sometimes more so, mm -hmm. more so. Mm -hmm. So think about nurturing and cultivating those things versus focusing your energy on the other person. Because if each person is thinking that way, then the entire team's going to rise. You're going to have a better work product, a better decision, a better relationship. Hi, Elizabeth with the Miracle Foundation. I'm really curious, um, especially Millie talked about uh, modeling behavior. Who are y'all's heroes and role models that's, as it relates to leadership? Well, mine, mine, unfortunately, I can't share anything that you would recognize. Mine, mine have largely been very personal people in my life who are you know, not like famous leaders or anything like that. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a good one for that one. Yeah, I think different people at different times, you know. So for me, it's, it can be situational. It can be uh, a particular characteristic, you know, someone that I know that might be extremely gracious. And so when I'm in a stressful situation, I think about her and how she handles situations under fire, how she's gracious. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if there's one one particular or even two or three particular people, because I have a, kind of a big circle of 
people that I admire and then other mm -hmm. people that you know, we all think about people who are on the national level that may have a characteristic that we'd love to emulate and we work toward. Yeah, I think you're right about the certainly personal ones, teachers um, growing up, uh, huge um, school counselors uh, growing up, middle school, high school, huge life-changing individuals in my life personally. Um, I'm not Catholic and did not grow up Catholic, but the Virgen de Guadalupe is a huge model for me because she's an indigenous virgin that could not be conquered and changed, you know? So the Spaniards were like, just let them keep her, you know? <laughs> just fine. La Virgen Morena, fine. Um, when they were really, I mean, it, it's amazing. Um, and then, you know, like Rachel Maddow, like people that are brilliant and uh, like that, that don't give up and don't give in and, and are super in inspirational depending on the times. Mm -hmm. Yes, John? Uh, yes, what did your parents, particularly your fathers, do that kind of prepared you to become the strong <sighs> Gosh. That's a great question. I'll, t I'll take it because it's controversial um, <laughs> for me. Um, I grew up in an abusive household. My father is physically and verbally abusive. Um, and he set the best bad example I ever could have had. Um, my mother set a bad example too because she resisted so much and she, but you know, she was also victimized. So now in my older age, I see that she was, she was me, she was us, she was in our shoes. Um, but at the time I was like, another bad example of how not to be, you know. Um, but there were good qualities in him too. He was an entrepreneur incredibly hardworking, he was a fantastic friend, terrible family man, but a really fantastic friend and helped wherever he could and there are really positive things um, about him. So I think it's exactly that modeling of good and bad in one human being. Either of you want to answer that question? You know, I, to boil it down, uh, I think my, my, fa my father's journey really showed me the value of hard work. I mean, he was just a hard-working, dedicated, uh, get-it-done person. Um, and I think that, you know, if I were to choose two of my favorite characteristics from each of my parents, my mom is really where I got the curiosity from, which is more the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial nature. But my dad has a um, profound problem-solving analytical side to him as an engineer and, you know, just sort of muster through really difficult things. Um, but like me, the older they get, the more I realize, the less they know. <laughs> oh my and so, God, you know, that is so true. You know, with my, with my dad, what, um, the, I think the things that I look back on and value are very different than the way I see him today. Yeah. Uh, and so the reconciliation of that, I think particularly for, for women, my mom stayed at home um, and, and so, but she, she also was educated. So she got a master's degree and taught, but then when she got two kids and it was more cost effective to stay at home than pay for daycare, she quit working. And, um, uh, you know, anyway, so that's a really loaded question, a really awesome one. And I think that somebody should write a book with women leaders about their like relationships to their parents. I'm sure they have. We learned so much from both of them, you know, yeah. and yeah. I mean, my father is very, um, He's retired from the uh, Air Force and the Securities Exchange Commission. And um, he and my mother both have uh, master's degrees. He was always, he is always very focused, always has a plan. What's your next step? You know, have you seen, have you, do you, have you have a long range plan or what's your approach to accomplishing these goals on the plan? And he'll check in with you on those things. <laughs> my mother is, you know, very gracious, generous. She also is focused in that way but she is the person who encouraged me early on to learn as much about as many things as I wanted. And so when I was in college, um, I was fortunate that I, I didn't have to work when I was in college as, as an undergrad, and I lived on campus the whole time. And when I would register for different things, I was an English major, but I was a classic liberal arts person. I was all over the map. I mean, I took <laughs> English, French. I took architecture for non-architects because I loved art and architecture. And I remember my dad asking me, okay, you know, with each one of these options, is that marketable? <laughs> is that going to lead to a job in this area? Oh my gosh. And, and, and my mother... I heard mother, you about the president, Toya. And then my mother saying, 
this is wonderful. Learn as much as you can while you're there and you have this opportunity because you're in a fortunate situation. So take in as much as you can. Just make sure you have a plan to graduate. And so that was the, you know, that was the compromise. But I love that she said that because it really encouraged that lifelong learning mm -hmm. in me, but also the discipline to have a plan of some type. Yes. My parents were both journalists covering Watergate, so I had no choice. Ah. <laughs> right here and then right there. Or I guess you've got the mic back there. So start there and then we'll come up here. Um, well, first I want to say that hearing all this is incredibly validating as a person who's uh, developing uh, management and administrative role. Um, this question is about self-care because I'm also a counselor. So um, how do you manage not to stay angry or stay shrill or flip a table during a meeting when um, you have to maintain your ladylike behavior or not be too bossy or too assertive? Like, how do you guys take care of yourselves to not stay angry or burn out or rage quit uh, when, you know, people are putting their implicit bias on you or you're uh, very obviously fighting the patriarchy um, and just kind of, you know, having a bad day and, and pushing your way through, you know, being a leader and, and just keep going on a day-to-day -day basis. How do you take care of yourselves and maintain? I flip tables, but you guys work for the government, so you can't do that, so <laughs> what do you do? Flip tables in private. No. Yep. Um, you know, I think um, um, mostly uh, try to keep balance through perspective, right? Like whatever the thing is, just try to put it in its proper, wherever you can think of, proper place of importance in life and the overall pursuit of happiness, right? Whatever that means for you. What power are you giving this thing and in what order? So where, where are you placing it and what kind of perspective? And then. And then oftentimes, you'll, even if it's something really important, like if someone's life's at stake, then you know it's important. But like when no one's life is at stake, I tell my colleagues all the time, I'm like, no one's life's at stake. Don't freak out about that. Don't make yourself crazy about that. And then a month down the line, your perspective that you, that you have about that thing that you had misplaced perspective on is totally different. And look, you've been pissed off for a month. <laughs> we have time, I think, for one more. So, yep. I'll, I'll try to make it a good one. Um, well, and first off, thank you all for being here. I'm pretty sure I can speak for most people that we really appreciate this conversation. It's been really great tonight. Uh, my question for y'all or whomever wants to answer is in the discussion about the wage disparity, but also maternity leave and females being the main caregivers, there have been... Um, Thoughts from women like Sheryl Sandberg and Anne-Marie Slaughter who have said that nothing will really change with that until some of our societal norms have changed regarding men being becoming more of a caretaker in the family and kind of sharing a little bit more of that balance. So understanding those are all very personal decisions between yeah. couples, but what advice would you give a woman who wants to approach that with their partner? Get very, very clear with yourself and honest with yourself about what what you really want and need. Because I think we go into a lot of those conversations sort of like the societal message is plain and we're, we're supposed to not uh, want to, I don't know, I'm, if you're a strong woman, like you're supposed to not want to stay at home. You you're, you're want to be Sheryl Sandberg, you want to do it all. You know, and like you may actually really want to stay at home. Or, you know, vice versa. Um, you may have married a macho man and you never thought you would have a dad that stays at home. And like, I just, I think we have these really convoluted, crazy conversations without getting clear about our position um, sort of outside of the, the pressures of what we think we're supposed to want. And even in leadership too, like, um, do you want to be that leader in your office and or suite who has to be the orchestra conductor of 5, 10, 15, 20, 100 people 
and be constantly flexing to everyone's wonderful, unique personality. <laughs> it is exhausting. And sometimes, you know, you, do you, is that what you want to do? And are you good at it? I mean, if, you, if you're not good at it, then you're just going to be exhausted and bitter and upset for months all the time. But, um, but if you can orchestrate those things and conduct and, and, and meet people where they are and be equitable and not equal all the time, it, you're just going to find so much more success. I have a one-year-old, and my husband is at home with her right now. And my advice is get a great Google Calendar where you can just send him invitations for all the things you need him to do. <laughs> it works quite well. And then don't criticize when he does something not the way you want him to. Yeah. So <laughs> that's been the best takeaway. So anyway, well, help me, please help me thank this incredible panel of women.